welcome everybody in the room, everybody tuning in online. If you are at one of our Ports Live locations, welcome Ports Live, Des Moines, Indy, Greater Lafayette, Tulsa, Boise, Scottsdale, Houston, Austin, wherever you are tuning in from, we are continuing this series, FAQ, looking at some frequently asked questions. Let me start with a story that happened a couple days ago in my world. It was Sunday afternoon after church here, took the kids home and told my wife, man, I'm gonna take our older two kids to the pool, community pool down the road. Six-year-old son, four-year-old daughter, load them up in the car, head towards the pool. I realized on the way there, all the pool toys that I had at one point, we had accidentally left or something had happened and they just had disappeared. And so I thought, dad of the year, let's stop at Walgreens. I'm gonna let you guys pick out any pool toy you want. Go into the store, you get a toy, you get a toy, congrats. We walk into the store and I head immediately over to like the pool toy section at Walgreens, which is not that impressive, but it exists. And I'm standing there and I'm like, hey, you can pick any of these out. And my daughter immediately, she's four, she finds some little like princess ball with Anna, Elsa and different princess. She's got it, she's locked in. And it was like $1.59, so I'm winning already. I look at my son and I say, man, now, you, now she got her toy, you pick out your toy and then we're gonna go hit the pool. And he goes, I don't want one of these pool toys. I want that. And he points over to a $15 superhero that I was like, no, we are going to a pool toy to go swim in the pool. Remember, I'm dad of the year. You weren't even gonna get a toy. And then I decided to graciously allow you to pick a toy. And so we're gonna pick one of these pool toys over here. And he says, I don't want that. I don't want that. I was like, okay, then you're not gonna get anything. He said, okay, fine, I want that. And he points to something else. And it's like this Pokemon pack thing. He doesn't even understand what Pokemon is. And I'm like, you don't even know what to do with that. We're not gonna get that. And he's like, no, that's what I want. And I said, great, you're gonna pick one of these or you're not getting anything. And he he says, no, that's not what I want. I want something else. And I said, great, we're not gonna get anything. So we start walking out and he just goes ballistic like a six-year-old does, waterworks everywhere, screaming in the middle of Walgreens. And it's one of those moments as a parent where you're like, oh my, you are not getting it. You're gonna get a spanking is what you're gonna get, no toy. And I said, thank you, spanking. <laughs> oh man, you don't even have kids. And you're saying spanking. <laughs> Oh, oh man, that one got me. Anyway, so I say, hey, we're gonna get in the car, we're not getting a toy. In fact, she's not getting a toy, nobody's getting a toy, all of our fun gone, get in the car. And he just continues to go ballistic. And I said, hey, I wanted you to get a pool toy because we're going to the pool so that you could play with your pool toy at the pool. And he is still unmoved and goes, I don't want that. And eventually we get in the car, we head to the pool. No toy. Now, what does it have to do with tonight? Well, at the heart of tonight's topic, it is felt and can feel for people who struggle with this particular thing as though the church has said, hey, there's this gift that God has and God wants you to have, but it's a gift that can only be experienced and a gift that is to be experienced in a specific context. Just like, hey, this is a, I'm gonna get you a toy gift, but it's for the pool. We have to get a pool toy, and if you wanna experience it, you've gotta experience it there. And for people who struggle with what I'm gonna bring up in a conversation, it can feel like, man, that's not a gift that I want. More specifically, what I wanna talk about tonight is, can I, follow Jesus and be LGBTQIA+, or LGBT, just so that I don't get tongue-tied for the rest of the sermon, because it can feel like, man, I wanna follow Jesus, but the church is always saying, hey, there's this gift God has given of sex for marriage and that relationship and a man and a woman, and I don't want that gift. And you're telling me, just like me saying to my son, no, we're gonna go play the pool. I don't wanna go to the pool. And I don't want that gift. And you telling me, hey, just enjoy it and just experience God's design of marriage between man and a woman, that's not something I want. And this is a really personal issue for a lot of us who have, like me, people in your family or people who were roommates in college or people 
in your immediate family, siblings, uncles, a father member, or a father, a mother, someone who struggles, or is a part of this community. And so as Christians, what would God say? And I wanna launch into this conversation, and let me say a couple things up front. Tragically, too often, the church, when it comes to this topic, has done a really poor job of speaking to it in a way that is loving, truthful, and gracious. And it's taken God's word, which is meant to be a gift to guide us to life, and it has hit people, so to speak, and beat them down with it. And if you are listening right now, or at a later date, you're tuning in, I want you to stay with me throughout the entire message. And I want you to know that if you're here tonight or you know somebody that is in the LGBTQIA plus community, that you are welcome here, you are loved, God is not done with you, just like he's not done with all of the different pornography viewing and sexual sin and heterosexual ways that it's inside of this room. And you're amongst a bunch of broken people, myself very much included, who are clinging to Jesus and living in God's grace every single day. And what you're not gonna hear in this sermon is a picketing, because oftentimes Christians have seemed to isolate this specific issue. You don't see a lot of pickets and marches for anti-gossip. And the church has done a bad job of communicating with both grace and with truth. And so I wanna to attempt to answer that tonight. We're gonna to take a lot, we're gonna fly through a lot of information and walk through, can I be LGBTQIA plus and follow Jesus? Because the answer might surprise you. And so I wanna answer that first question and then go into a couple underneath that, which is the first one of, hey, can I be LGBT and follow Jesus? Well, first, what does it mean to follow Jesus? The Bible says that when we use the vernacular, the language of like, hey, following Jesus and trusting in Christ and coming to a place where you accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, that's where you, if you haven't heard this before, a Christian is simply somebody who says, I accept Jesus as the payment for my sin on the cross. When he died on the cross, he paid for everything past, present, future, every sexual sin in my past, every sin in general that I've ever done, and every sin I ever will commit. I'll never be able to earn a relationship with God, but Jesus has made a way so that I could have eternal life with him. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And then the Holy Spirit begins to work in that person's life and begin to convict and begin to bring about change in their life. But may, may, let me be abundantly clear, someone does not change in order to become a Christian. Someone becomes a Christian or trusts in Christ and Jesus, through his spirit, begins to change them. And so following Jesus includes, man, I'm trusting him for salvation. And Jesus also said, if you wanna follow me, and this is to everybody, in Luke chapter nine, verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? Well, when this was spoken to his followers, Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. In fact, he hadn't even predicted he was gonna die on the cross yet. So what they just heard is Jesus said, you know that instrument of death? This would be in the 1600s saying the guillotine, pick up your guillotine or pick up the gas, the execution of the day and follow me. What is he saying? He's saying, hey, those who follow me are going to die daily to themselves and their preferences. And the call on all of us who follow Jesus regardless of our sexuality, is to continually, despite imperfectly, say, God, man, I, I am surrendered to your will, and I am not perfect, and I am attempting to, and there are parts of me that don't want to follow everything that you say in the Bible. But you, by your spirit, I am seeking to walk in dependence with you and die daily. That's what Jesus said it means to follow him. So that's what it means to follow Jesus, it's trusting in him for eternal life and trusting him and dying daily in this life. Now what does it mean to be LGTB? 
LGBTQIA+. Well, I wanna focus specifically on the same-sex relationships aspect of that. And there's a number of different reasons for that, and we may do a views from the porch on some of the intersex or some of the queer questioning and the different things involved in that, but the first four have tremendous overlap in regards to same-sex relationships. If by LGBT you mean I have a disposition either that I can't explain because I was introduced to same-sex pornography or I experienced some sort of event and I can trace it back in my life, or you can't, and you would just say, as long as I can remember, I've had attraction to the same sex. When all the other kids were uh, going through puberty and they had attraction to girls if they were boy and boy, or yeah, boys if they were girl, I, I didn't have that. If you simply mean attraction, the Bible wouldn't classify that as sin. Same-sex attraction is different than same-sex action. By same-sex attraction, all that that means is, man, I have a wiring for whatever reason, and this is a temptation for me, which wouldn't be a sin any more than a guy who's married, like myself, who still has attraction to women that are not my wife. Now, it's not a sin to have that attraction. It's a sin for me to sleep with someone who's not my wife. And the Bible doesn't speak to orientation. It speaks to action. Because even the language of the orientation, it wasn't as developed or existent. What Paul and over and over, as we're going to see in the scripture, speaks to is that sexual action outside of the context of marriage, which we're gonna look at here in a second. And that can be heterosexual, that can be oral sex, that can be pornography, that can be sex, with, which is candidly a lot more prevalent in this room than homosexual sin is. And it's just as offensive to God to be sleeping with your girlfriend as it is to be sleeping with your boyfriend of the same sex. Both of which are outside of God's design for sexuality. And so if by LGBT you mean, hey, I am living and existing in same-sex relationships. You are living outside of God's design for sexuality and for relationships. Paul, the apostle, says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. There's about seven different locations in the Bible that speak specifically to same-sex relationships. Six towards male and male relationships and one towards female and female. Every time it speaks how this is not God's design, not how God created it. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 says, The sexually immoral, which is sex in any context outside of marriage, nor idolaters, which is greed, worshiping something, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Wait, Paul, are you saying that being gay or bisexual or lesbian will keep you out of heaven? No. He's saying embracing unrepentant sin is a mark of someone, generally speaking, who doesn't know Jesus. And he uses a number of different things. Hey, people who consistently get drunk or slander or swindle or rob from or are thieves that he's saying hey, anyone who is embracing, the point is not a specific type of sexuality, it's saying anyone who embraces living in a way that God says is wrong is someone who is not living consistent with the faith that they claim to have in Jesus. And so can I follow God and be perpetually sleeping around with people of the opposite sex? Paul would say that is confusing at best or a mark of the fact that you don't actually have a relationship with Jesus. And his point is about unrepentant sinful behavior is not the mark of the people of God. Now, doesn't Jesus say judge not? This is something you're probably gonna hear a lot, is, hey, Jesus said don't judge, the Bible said don't judge, you're not supposed to judge. The Bible doesn't say not to judge, it says how to judge. If you don't believe me, 
and you listen at a later date, or you listen to it right now, you can flip open to 1 Corinthians chapter five, where the apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he's writing this letter. And in the letter, he says, you need to judge this specific person. And he gives this identification of a guy in the church group, the small group at that time, and he says, there's a guy who is sleeping around with his father's wife, as in his father had gotten remarried, and, and he's having an affair with his father's new wife. And Paul says, even people outside of the church are like, oh man, that is Jerry Springer. That is not okay. Springer stuff. Uh Uh-uh. That's what Paul says. He said, even the church, even people who are not Christian are going, whoa, (laughs) let's back it up here. Paul says, and this guy is boasting as though, look at me, I'm living in sin and Jesus paid for it. And he says, that person doesn't know Jesus. The Bible doesn't say not to judge, just how to judge. Often, Well, Jesus never spoke about same-sex relationships. Jesus didn't speak about a lot of things. If the criteria for whether something is okay for a Christian or not is whether Jesus specifically spoke about it, then things like someone beating their wife would be okay, which it certainly is not. Jesus never spoke about heroin, which it certainly is not. But the Bible clearly over and over speaks, and I wanna get to God's heart behind this, to God's design for marriage, sexuality, and that living in a same-sex relationship is not living in line with God's design. As Christians, and maybe this will help, especially if, if you're listening and you're here maybe for the first time and you're just, you're not certain why Christians seem to be so adamant. And candidly, just, if this is your first time, we talk about issues related to heterosexual sin, gossip, pornography, substance. We talk about all of that 10 times X, we talk about this. But the Bible says that we're to take God's word and it's to be the standard that informs how we live. Then in a culture that says, man, you do what you feel, you do what you want, you do what you think, For you, Christians, because we said, man, I'm following Jesus. I gave up the right to say, you know what? I do what I want, Jesus. I'll get to, I'll pick and choose what you want. No, it says as Christians, we pick up our cross and we die daily and we use the standard of God's word. What's interesting is no matter what somebody believes, your coworkers, people around you, people who have no faith in Jesus, everybody has a standard. In fact, as tolerant as our society is, there's things where we would go, That's out of bounds, no matter what somebody believes. You guys know who the number one music recording artist, single artist of all time is? You guess? Elvis. Elvis, man, this is a smart front area right here. (laughs) Elvis Presley is the, and I haven't seen the movie, this is not an endorsement for any of that, Elvis Presley is the single most successful recording artist of all time. In fact, when you look at all bands collectively, The only one that beats him is the Beatles. And Elvis, who only lived at 42 years old, I mean, the number of different hits that he had, it was was crazy. And just the successfulness that he puts Taylor Swift, Drake, everybody, it's not even close. He's in another stratosphere. But Elvis wasn't just incredibly successful. He also had some really broken sexuality that you may not be familiar with. When he married his wife, Priscilla, in, in the 1970s, and this is not a critique of, of Elvis, who I don't know, and I hope he's in heaven. I hope she trusted in Jesus. But as she records, they got married, and about nine months later, they had their first babies, Lisa Marie. And Priscilla would go on to say that when she was pregnant with her baby, Elvis made clear, I won't sleep with you once you have the baby. I'm not attracted to women who've had babies. And I will sleep around, and he did. Now my guess is, if you're hearing that, that's not exactly the type of romantic love that you wanna have in your future. And most of us would go, wait a second, what? She got pregnant, she had his baby, and he said, oh yeah, by the way, I don't sleep with moms, so I'm gonna move on from here. (laughs) That's not cool. Because you would go, that's not right. Now let me ask you a question, I'm being serious. Apart from holding to a biblical standard, some sort of anchor, a compass, something that informs what you believe, why is it not right? And you would say, well, it just doesn't sit right. That's so wrong. Why? It's just your opinion. 
And this is where as Christians, we don't have a choice of going, this is my opinion or not. This is what God's word says. Even when I don't like it, he's calling me to follow it. Maybe you would say, no, hey, I'm fine with that. I don't matter. But my guess is there's other examples. You know, there's a group that um, the vast majority of every person I've ever met would say, that's out of bounds and not okay. That violates my standard of what's sexually appropriate and what's not. It's a group that's located in America. It's called the North American, it's called NAMBLA, the North American Association of Man-Boy Love. It's a group that advocates for the consent and the age of consent to be removed for people who were born with a sexual desire to sleep with younger kids and for children who were born with a sexual desire to sleep with older men. Now, because the Bible makes clear, it's not just consensuality that makes something okay or not. The Bible makes clear sex is intended to be experienced in the context of marriage between one man and one woman. I can clearly say that's not okay. But apart from having a standard, you can go, hey, no, this is right, and no, it's the, that's illegal, that's the law of There's a lot of things that were legal at one point in this country, and it didn't make them right but there's something inside of you that says, no, that's not okay. And I would agree. And if you're a Christian, you can, because the Bible, if you're not, you're just going based on your opinion. And God's word is to be this thing that informs us and the standard that we hold to. Even when society around says, man, you're a bigot, you're hateful, you don't love people. And that is not any of my heart or any of the people that are around here is hard ever to come across as. And you are loved no matter your sexuality, no matter if you agree with me or you listen to me or you care what I have to say, no matter if you care what God has to say or you ever come to trust in Jesus. And you're welcome here as long as you want. But when it comes to the issue of sexuality as it relates to, when it comes to every issue, As Christians, we go, what does God's word say about this? So that's my next question. What does God's word say about LGBT relationships? Well, as I mentioned already, there's six different occasions. That's in Genesis chapter 19, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Romans chapter one. I'll read that one in a second. 1 Corinthians 6, verse nine. I said 1 1 Timothy 1, verse 10, where it explicitly says these type of relationships are not what God desires are not consistent with his design. But it also says that same-sex relationships are inconsistent with his design for things like marriage, that the Supreme Court can redefine marriage, but that doesn't mean God now recognizes that as a marriage. It says over and over the teachings of scripture that marriage is between a man and a woman. And I don't say any of this to shame or make anybody feel uncomfortable or make your uncle who's gonna listen to this message two years from now upset. I say it to go, this is just what the Bible says. And because I believe it's God's word and it's true, I don't get to pick and choose. Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, he said this, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Jesus is defining marriage. The two will become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Paul, speaking about marriage and saying it's between a man and a woman in this matrimony, says it's not just between a man and a woman, it's ultimately a metaphor, which is why God cares so much about it. And he repeats the same verse, which is a quote from Genesis chapter two. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Then he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. That Paul says, marriage is a metaphor. Earthly marriage between a man and a woman is a picture of God's unending, unbreakable union with his bride, the church. And it's meant to be a picture to the watching world. But it is clear over and over, the teaching is between one man and one woman. It's also inconsistent in regards to what does the Bible teach. It also teaches that same-sex relationships are inconsistent with God's vision of sexuality, which was a gift, the very first gift God gave to be experienced between man and woman. Genesis chapter one, verse 27 says this. God created mankind in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Let me hit something, just side note, really quick. The image of God in humanity is not seen in men, and it's not seen in women. In other words, the fullness of seeing the image of God on display in terms of humanity is seen in men and women, male and female. The qualities and characteristics of women, just like men, equally reflect together the image of God. Which is why in a society and why Satan is consistently trying to dissolve and assault even the perspective that there is male and female. Because if he can get rid of that, he is getting rid of the image of God being reflected in our world. But he made male and female in the image of God to reflect the image of God, just like women reflect aspects of the image of God and men reflect aspects of the image of God. One of them on their own does not fully reflect the fullness of the image of God. But then it said this, it's the very first gift, and Adam said, amen. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Increase in number and fill the earth. That God's very first command was, hey, I want you to have sex and make babies. In other words, creation is five minutes old. God just finished, he's rested, he's looking around, the angels are like, man, this is awesome. What are you gonna do next? He's like, man, you better watch out, you've seen nothing yet. Tells them, I want you guys to be fruitful and multiply. And the angels are like, whoa, we have never got to be a part of that. And Adam's first command is, I want you to have sex with your wife and your wife, you guys to come together. And out of the overflow of that sexuality and that intimacy and that love together, you are going to procreate and replicate and increase. In other words, the purpose of sexuality and sex in general is not just pleasure, it's procreation. It's a gift that pleasure is involved to it, and God over and over hits it. That God is the inventor of sex. He's so for it. We talk about that all the time. But part of the purpose of procreation or of sexuality involves procreation between a man and a woman. So it doesn't just say that God says it's inconsistent with his design. It's inconsistent with marriage. It's also inconsistent with the purpose of sexuality. And finally, it's inconsistent with his design, as I've said. In Romans chapter 1, verse 25, it says, Paul, speaking about how you can see a society has rejected the truth and embraced a lie. And he says this, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones with other women. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with men, with other men, and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, when you read those, if you have same sex as a part of your current attraction or struggle in the past, you can feel all kinds of shame. Paul's point is just a clear reflection of rejecting God's design. And he doesn't just use this one, he uses idolatry, he uses worship of self, later in the passage he uses disobedience to parents and hatred and murder. But his point is, hey, it's a clear rejection of God's design and here's what happens when you reject a creator's design. Consequences. Like we see this on like small levels. There's times where my wife, I've learned that if I go to wash the laundry that is her clothes and my clothes, I have to be very careful to not take clothes from a very specific pile that she throws in the closet on the floor in a very specific location. Why? Because in the past, I would go in there, get all the laundry, husband of the year, throw it in here, gonna throw this in the washing machine, and I throw it in there, and inevitably gets washed, and then I put it in the dryer, and I get it out, and I'm like, man, I'm not just gonna stop there, I am gonna fold these things, and I'm gonna fold it all up, and I'll pull out a shirt or a sweater made of something called cashmere. And when it went in the washing machine, it was like this big. And then it came out and it was like this big. And I'll try to get it wet and stretch it out and stretch it out. And then I look on the tag and it says, cashmere, do not wash or dry or hand wash and hang dry. And as silly as that is, anytime that we reject, dismiss, fail to follow the creator's instructions, there's consequences. And what do I mean by consequences? I want to share some statistics that will be available in the message description of this message on YouTube and will be available on the porch blog as early as tomorrow or the next day 
at the porch.live forward slash blog that are not indicative of all same-sex relationships ever, but they are trends, and I wanna be very specific and make sure that all of the research is published exactly and so you can go find, because in today's age, you can go find whatever you know, link and stat you want from BuzzFeed or what Vox or whatever that's out there, and these are peer-reviewed, medical-published surveys and research to see why if you're God, you would say, I don't want this, just like I don't want all the pain that comes with pornography addiction, but now and in future marriages, all the different ways that any type of living outside of God's design has negative, painful impact. So what are some of the ways that that takes place in terms of when you go against God's design? One is in the arena of mental health. The United Kingdom reported that homosexuals are, in a study that was done, 50% more likely to suffer from depression and engage in substance abuse than the rest of the population. They're 200% in the same study found more likely to be at risk for suicide. LGBT youth have been found to be three times more likely to commit suicide. Often it's attributed that this is from a stigma of society where they are a minority and have not been accepted, but even in countries that have gone the farthest to produce and encourage and celebrate the type of relationships, there's not a reduction in the incidence of suicide, there's actually an increase. A study was done in Sweden which legalized same-sex marriage, which US did in 2015. Sweden did in 1944. It made speaking against sexual orientation a crime prosecutable as hate speech in 2003. It was recognized by the International Lesbian Gay Association as the most gay-friendly country in Europe. Today, there's a 300% increase in risk of suicide among homosexual men. That's from the European Journal of Epidemiology. There's an overall decrease in life expectancy. The Eastern Psychological Association found the average life expectancy for someone who lives in the LGBT community it's dramatically lower than heterosexuals. It was found to be over 20 years lower. Only 1% of homosexual men died from old age, and the study concluded it's a lifestyle more dangerous than smoking. I don't say any of this to say anything other than there are clear trends that God is saying, I don't want the pain that comes along, the extinction of life, Part of the reason for the decrease in life longevity is related to the increased likelihood of disease. Only 3% of the US population is in the LGB community. They are, make up 43% of the cases of syphilis. This is from the CDC 2020. 60% of cases of gonorrhea, 97% of the new epidemic of monkeypox, the new virus of monkeypox. In 2019, 70% of HIV cases, 70% were among homosexual men, 70% of the new cases in the United States. Why is disease so rampant? Studies have found that monogamy is an extreme minority. The Journal of Sexual Research, Journal of Sexual Research all these again will be listed found that the modal range, as in the largest range, a majority of where most people in the community fall, of sexual partners was between 101 and 500 in their lifetime. The study also reported that 10 to 15% had between 500 and 1,000 partners. Another that 10 to 15% reported more than 1,000 sexual partners. According to one study, 66% of gay couples reported sex outside of their monogamous relationship within the first year. The same study indicated that 90% of couples interviewed who were in a relationship had sex outside of that relationship with somebody within five years. In a society that says 
man, this is about love, it's at least also about sex. Now, as Christians, this is where we, as those called to love people, have to seek to do so in a way that is loving and affirming, and I wanna focus on how to do that exactly, especially with members who may not be believers, and how we shift the focus away from sexuality. But if somebody said, man, why can't you just encourage and support me making this decision? If a friend came to you and said, hey, I'm thinking about moving to this town, and in this town, you knew they would have a 300% increase in the likelihood of committing suicide, a 50% increase in the likelihood of substance addiction, drug addiction, or alcohol addiction, that they would have an increased likelihood of divorce and take 20 years off their life, would it be loving to say, you should move there? I think that's great. You're gonna take 20 years off your life You're gonna have sexually transmitted diseases virtually statistically a guarantee. You're gonna have an increased likelihood of suicide way higher than if you just stay celibate. And yet as a society, Christians have been so beat to say, man, if you reject them choosing despite those consequences, you are not loving. And when we look at God's word and you look at even what societal research says, could it be that the opposite is true? We actually are trying to love by not encouraging that. Could it be that the society that says, let them do whatever they want no matter the consequences on their life is actually the ones not loving? And Jesus said, and Paul taught, that love without the truth is not love. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse six says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Well, what if they were born that way? There's an article called, Adultery, It's in Our Genes, released in Time Magazine. And in it, there's a quote from Rick Warren, who's a pastor that just said, yeah, I was born with a desire to have sex with every beautiful woman that I see. And no one would say that's an encouraged thing. Someone who has a history of alcoholism in their family may be born with a higher propensity to be an alcoholic, which is gonna dramatically decrease their life expectancy and life fulfillment in general. And if they were in your life and said, hey, do you think that me drinking all day long is a bad thing? And if you tell me it is, you are a bigot. You would say, No, I love you enough to say it isn't. And I don't say any of this to diminish the feelings and the real temptations and all the different ways that that, that's a part of so many stories and so many friends. But this is the tension that we exist in. Finally, and I'm gonna move really quickly. How do we love the LGBT community like Jesus does? First thing that I've already said multiple times is we communicate Christ first. The greatest concern God has for humanity is not their sexuality, it's their relationship with him. That we focus on for non-believers, the church has no business in telling people and picketing outside, you should change your sexuality. Jesus didn't require us to change to become Christians. We became Christians and he's on a journey of changing all of us. So if you have friends that are in your life, if I was to sit down with a same sex couple that was sleeping together, I wouldn't focus on their sexuality any more than when I sit down with a heterosexual couple that's sleeping together. I'm gonna focus on Jesus. And what do they believe about Jesus? I had a friend and I was at this group and there was like some uh, influential Christian leaders from around the country and there was this conversation taking place and one of them said, man, I just, I, I don't know, it's so hard to, to talk. The, the goalpost has moved. Now the first question all of my non-Christian friends ask is, hey, did they accept homosexuality? What does your, your church think about homosexual relationships? And I just don't know what to say. And I said, I think you totally know what to say. You would say, I'm guessing, Somebody asks you that question, what do they think about homosexual, people who are in homosexual relationships? The same thing that I think about people in heterosexual relationships. They need Jesus. 
That every person's a broken, sinful person, and everyone was born broken with a sexuality that's broken. Myself, yourself, everyone. And so we focus first and foremost on Christ. How do we approach fellow believers as it relates to this issue? Those that we have a relationship with, we point them to the truth from God's word. Just like we hope that they point us to the truth from God's word. If I was sleeping with somebody who's not my wife, as I referenced earlier, I would hope that people who love me would come alongside and say, hey, this is not okay. You know that, right? Like, I don't, I've searched the Bible. This is something God does not encourage. And they would love me enough to speak that truth and come alongside. And we do this with any sin in any direction. That we live in community, the Bible says, with one another. Two other things. I wanna, if you're listening, and you're a part of the LGBT community and following Jesus, or not a part of that community, but you have same-sex attraction, and you are seeking to follow Jesus, I wanna speak specifically to you. And I'm talking to the person who said, man, I, despite the fact that God may never change my sexual desires, that I am attracted to the same sex, and God may never change those, but I am trusting him. And if he calls me to celibacy and calls me not to marriage, which is nothing and not something that I want at all, I am trying and seeking to trust him. I wanna to speak to you and acknowledge a couple things. One, the weight, all of us are called to carry our own cross and follow Jesus. The weight of the cross that you carry is heavier than others. It may not be the heaviest of all, but it is at least heavier in some ways than someone who would say, man, I don't struggle with that. And to the many of you here and listening online and around the country, you are an inspiration. I am so proud to worship Jesus with you. I am so proud to be a part of a church with you. You strengthen my faith. You make me love God more. You inspire me the way that you are willing to say, God, whatever it is, my sexuality, my future, my marriage, I'm giving it in your hands and I'm trusting it with you. Though none come with me, though the world around me says, just give it up, get in the relationship that you want. I am trusting you. God, help me trust you. You are an inspiration and the strength of your faith maybe four times the strength of a heterosexual that's in this room looking at pornography. And your willingness to say, God, I trust you. In addition, Jesus says that there is a special, eternal reward for anything that is sacrificed to those who surrender to him in this life. And he speaks in Isaiah specifically about sexuality and remaining single for the kingdom of God. It says this in Isaiah chapter 56. He speaks of eunuchs, but at that time was just somebody who couldn't have sex or couldn't get married. So the eunuchs who choose, verse four of 56, Isaiah 56, who choose to do what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give them within my eternal temple, that's in heaven, and its walls a memorial and a name that is better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever and ever. Finally, if that's a part of where you are, as much as it would be a disservice for me to say, man, God cannot, or God has promised, if you just walk with Jesus, he's gonna change that. Because he hasn't promised that. I've seen many stories where he has, but he hasn't promised that. But it would equally be a disservice for me to say, hey, if you walk with Jesus and you depend on his spirit and you yield to him and you trust him and you trust him that God couldn't bring change in your life because it's just not true. First Corinthians, that same passage, let me read it and I'm about to close. It said this, don't you know Wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, people, men who have sex with men, thieves, or greedy, or drunkards, or slanders, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you're not anymore. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. How? By behaving? No 
by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. And Paul says, man, that was some of your stories. That's not your story. That doesn't define you anymore. There's a friend of mine who was in same-sex relationships for 15 years. He's in LA. He just thought, this is a part of my life. His name's Leonard. And he would find himself just torn over, man, I don't know that I want to be this way, and yet I'm giving into this, and I don't even know that I could ever stop giving into this, and he just was so broken. He stumbled into a church, and there he heard the gospel, and he trusted in Christ, but he still had his sexual desires that were still there, and he didn't know what to do with them, and he just felt even more tormented over, God, when will you change this? Will you ever change this? And his story, and I'm not saying it's your story or everyone's story, his story is he just came to a place where he began to attend a small group of other people and he began to live in the light and he began to go, God, if you never change this, I'm gonna trust you. And he said, God, just, he saved me. And he began to rewrite his story. He eventually met a, a girl named Mandy and he thought, oh, man, I'll never. And their relationship, he thought, would never be something that would be a part of his life. And yet, God began to bring change in his heart. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't something that just everything went away. And she loved Jesus, and he loved Jesus, and they eventually got married. And then shortly after that, they had a little girl that was born. Here's her picture. And her name's Hope. And I was talking to her earlier today. And his story is that there is hope. God may not write the same one that he is for you and wherever you are and whatever God, whatever your story in general is. If you're struggling with heterosexual sin, homosexual sin, God loves you and there's hope. But it's not found in yourself. It's found in the spirit of God. Walking in community with the people of God. And there's no one who's run too far or who has done too much to not experience God's grace in their life. Can you be someone who has sexual attraction that the world would say makes them LGBT and follow Jesus? You absolutely can. Just like you can be heterosexual and you follow Jesus by surrendering to him and his will, and trusting him, knowing that whatever and wherever you're at, there is hope, you are loved, God loves you, and he's not done. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the friends that have been a part, that are a part of this gathering, of this church, the men and women who have surrendered their sexuality, their relationships, just our life in general to you. And those of us that have had to through sexual, heterosexual ways, and those of us through homosexual ways, God, I thank you specifically for the men and women who battled same-sex attraction, who have said, God, no matter if it means that the course that I wish I would have is not the one that I'm gonna have, if celibacy is the future that I have, God, I'm gonna seek to trust you. Will you help me trust you, how they inspire and strengthen the body of Christ all over the world in a culture and in a world that screams, follow your feelings and your heart. Don't let anyone tell you that you should do otherwise. They say, I'm going to follow Jesus. And I thank you personally for the inspiration they consistently are. And I thank you for the ways that we get to surrender and walk with you and you have a future and a hope for us. I pray that anyone who hears this that feels condemned would by your spirit feel free and feel hope. We worship our King. Amen.